Thanks, Fazil. Um, good morning, everybody. Thank you to the organisers for this opportunity. Before I start into my talk, I wanted to give a dedication to Sam Calonso. Sam welcomed many of us sitting here in this room to Anjoro Research Station in Kenya. He worked alongside us. He made a huge contribution to rust activities in Kenya and in particular the surveillance work. His passing away earlier this year was it was a huge loss for the global Ross community. He's he was a wonderful person and we'll we'll miss him. So I'm going to talk about tracking the wheat rust pathogens. This I'll present with contributions from, from many colleagues um, representing several different institutions. They've all contributed greatly to, to this, this work. So as an outline, it, all of this really goes back to the work William Wergori and then followed up by Zach Pretorius. What they did in Uganda, the observations and the subsequent lab analysis, and that led to this pro proliferation of surveillance activities all around the world. And then what we tried to do is link all that information together, put it into information systems. So this talk, it's really going to be about the, the journey that we've made from those initial observations, the work in, in Uganda, towards the situation that we have today where we have this extensive network of surveillance that's operational, how we've been able to, to pull all that information together and now present an up-to-date synthesized picture to, to the rest of the world. So that's really the basis of, of what I'll talk about. This, this morning. So the global rust monitoring work, UG99, that was really the catalyst. That was, that was the spark for, for all this, this work. Isolate UG99, which was race type to be TTKSK, soon realized that it, it, it was quite unique. I mean, in terms of the virulence package that it, it, it possessed, um, we really hadn't seen anything like this before. It was also soon realized just what a large proportion of the, the world's commercial cultivars were susceptible. And this led, I mean, to the efforts, I mean, championed by, by Dr. Borlaug, the realization that we, we, we needed a global system to be able to detect and monitor these new virulent races of, of wheat rust. And, and UG99 was, was just the example that woke us all up, that we didn't have monitoring systems in place and we really needed to pick up these important changes, find out where they were occurring, and then subsequent changes that were, and, and migrations that were happening as a result of, of those. So that's, that's the, the foundation for, for, for all of this, this work. I'm gonna start off by asking the question, well, what is UG99? I mean, we, it's a fantastic tag for, for communication, but it's, we often talk about it as it's, it's just a single entity, when the reality now is that this is far from the truth. What we should be talking about is the, the UG99 race group. 
The work that's been done around the world, we now recognise that there are eight members within that race group. And if you look at the, the paper that we've put together for this, this conference, um, in that we provide a, a working definition of, of the UG99 race group. So you can see that here. So we've got the group of PGT racers sharing almost identical molecular fingerprints to the original UG99 isolate race TTKSK. Most racers in the group have virulence to SR31, but SR31A virulent progenitors or relatives are also included. So you'll see the, the subgroup at the right-hand side of the slide, TTKSF, TTKSP, and the most recent edition, TTKSF+. All of those are avilorant on SR31 but they're very definitely members of the UG99 race group. So, in terms of being able to undertake the global monitoring, we realized that we, we needed to have eyes, eyes in the field. We needed a surveillance network, and we wanted this network to be comprehensive, covering large geographical areas, following pretty standardized methodologies. And as you can see here, we've been, what we've been able to achieve through the inputs from, from many people is the transition from a very data poor environment to an increasingly data rich environment. We've pushed up the coverage from 2007. We were looking at a couple of countries in East Africa that were contributing to the system. We're now up to 27 countries, and that's, that's going to increase further. Those contributing countries, they're covering about 20% of the global wheat area and a very high proportion of the developing wheat area. So the key areas throughout Africa, through Middle East, Central Asia, into South Asia, we're now including in this surveillance network. And I, I, I really think that's an outstanding example of, of global collaboration. I, I, I can't think of many other better examples. In terms of the pathogen monitoring, we've also made substantial progress. From the original identification of race TTKSK, We've now moved to a situation where we've, we've identified eight members of the UG99 race group. We know what they are, but we also know where, where they are. I mean, that, that is, is a substantial achievement. We've seen the spread throughout Africa and into Asia as far as Iran, and almost certainly we'll see further spread over time. So the UG99 race group, that, that graphic tries to summarize things. It's members of the race group, they're in 11 countries. Iran, Yemen, Eritrea, Sudan, Ethiopia, Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, Mozambique, Zimbabwe, and South Africa. So that's, that's the current status of the UG99 race race group and we're quite confident that that's an accurate picture what we're also seeing is changing pathogen populations so the the graphic here shows data coming out of the information system for 2009 2010 so the original ttksk race that's illustrated in red on the, the figure here. If you look throughout Africa, it only predominates now in Ethiopia. It's, it's other members of the UG99 race group that have now taken over in terms of predominance. And particularly what we've seen is, is an increase in the, the, the SR24 variants of the UG99 race group. 
So through the monitoring, we've been able to see how pathogen populations are, are, are changing over time. With the increasing amount of data, and I put lots of data here, I mean, I'm sure the molecular people in the room will, will laugh at the amounts of data we're, we're handling. It's, it's nothing in comparison to, to their systems. But it's still, it's a substantial amount of data. It's increasing and it's also quite diverse in ter terms of the types of data that we, we have to handle. So we also realized that we needed a, a good way to be able to manage and handle that, that data. So working with, with colleagues at the Global Rust Reference Center and also with colleagues in Sathguru in South Asia, we've put together we call, something we call the Wheat Rust Toolbox, which acts, acts as a, a, a data management system for all the, the data types that we're, we're handling. In terms of surveys, we, we have information in the system now, 27 countries, 9,000 plus records, and it's, it's growing all the, all the time. For pathotypes, there's, there's 21 countries, 1,000 plus isolates in the system. Again, it's, it's, it's growing, growing all the time. As an overview of what the, the data management system looks like, the, the toolbox, on the left-hand side of the slide, you'll see we have options to, to get data into the system. So we have online data entry systems. We've also developed um, mobile devices for data entry, so on smartphones and also most recently on, on tablets that allow us to, to feed data into the systems. We have the key databases there, the moment the survey, the pathotypes. We're also working on the trap nursery data information, molecular diagnostic information, and also Barbary survey information will go into the system as well. We're able to do quality control, publishing on the, the data, and we can control the, the user access to different parts of the, the site. And then the, the system also has the ability to generate a range of output tools. So we can take the raw data and then put it into a more, more visible, presentable form for people. So interactive maps, um, graphic tools, and also data ex exchange export facilities. So it's, it, it's a comprehensive system. It's now fully functional. People are using it. Um, so again, we've, we've, we've made good progress there. In terms of the toolbox, one, one component of it is um, any register user. Um, they, what we're trying to do is, is to add value um, to, to those users. So we can get data into the system, we can apply quality control, but then automatically the, the system will, will feed back to the user some, some dynamic um, country specific um, display tools. So you can see an example here for Ethiopia. There's a summary of all the, all the survey, so how many um, sites had stem rust, yellow rust, leaf rust by, by year, how that um, graphically showing that over time. So you can see 2010, the big yellow rust epidemic in Ethiopia it really shows up. Continued pretty high levels of yellow rust in Ethiopia in, in 2011 and then also a, um, a dy automatic dynamic map. So again, it's, it's allowing people put the data into the system and then they, they get something extra back, back out of it. We've also worked on the, the, the public information systems. So we've just launched something we call Rust Tracker. This is a, a web portal that aims to be a, a single source of up-to-date information for all the global wheat rust monitoring activities. So if you want to know what's going on, the idea is you would come here and you should be able to get the most up-to-date recent information. The content for that, we've put together uh, a series of country-specific pages, so we're covering about 38 countries, um, and that will increase over time, and the content will also um, increase. The portal includes 
many dynamic tools, and all of these are driven by the underlying data management system, the, the toolbox. So we have information in that system. Once it's been verified, published, then it automatically appears in the, in the public website. So we're trying to make everything as available to as many people um, as quickly as, as possible. With Rust Tracker and the, the, the toolbox, what we see is we've, we've now got a platform for, for all the Rusts. It's, it's not specific to, to STEM Rust. Sure, the, the initial focus was around STEM Rust um, and data content. But all the examples here, and they're, they're real examples, they're, they're all showing yellow rust. So that information, it's, it's in the system. We certainly want to increase it more. But, but we, we can deliver the information just as easily for, for yellow rust, leaf rust, as we, we can for, for stem rust. And that will be an increasing focus of, of the work in the, in the future. The one in the middle, this um, something we just started doing, is um, using the rich database we've got from surveillance, multiple years over time, applying geostatistical tools to those to come up with statistically significant hotspots for disease severity. So you, the example here is, is yellow rust in, in Ethiopia, and we'll be expanding this, this type of work but the idea here is that can we help guide decisions about priority areas for promoting resistant cultivars, promoting control activities. What we're also working towards is, is an integrated approach to the information resources that we've got. I talked about Rust Tracker, but we've also got other information portals that have been developed by, by different institutions, different colleagues. So at CIMIT we have the, the, the Wheat Atlas, um, Global Rust Reference Center has the wheatrust.org, and BGRI has, has globalrust.org. Now the people behind all of these, we're all trying to work together in a collaborative way. So the idea is that we, we would have single source databases for key information and then the information from those can feed into multiple access points from a from the public perspective so the left hand side you can see we've got the the toolbox so the the databases the survey path type in in the bluish color they already exist the ones in green are in development and will come online quite soon we've also worked together with um, Dr. Sergei Martinov's group at the Vavilov Institute. They developed a, a fantastic resource in wheatpedigree.net, and I would encourage all of you to, to, to look at that, that site. But we're working together with them to try and consolidate all the, the, the CIMIT uh, cultivar information databases with, with that resource and then again have it available in, in different places for, for people. Then other colleagues, colleagues at, at Cornell, Darcy Dill, she's, she's working on the, the, the screening nursery database. So again, that's another resource that would feed into different information platforms. So again, I think this is really encouraging that, that many people in different places, we're all coming together, consolidating our efforts, and making sure there's the, the, the highest value from, from these efforts. Some of the new activities that we're undertaking, um, we just got some very good news that um, a, a big project around epidemiology modeling and, and early warning from Cambridge University and, and Rothamsted. This has just been approved and funded by the, the Gates Foundation. So this, this project will now, now be coming on, online. We'll be working very closely with those, those groups. Um, so I would expect to see, we, we're going to see many more advances in, in, in terms of being able to identify the 
areas of suitability for the, the pathogen and persistence. Um, also identify priority areas that we, we really need to be um, undertaking surveillance in. So these might be stepping stone areas for towards new regions or the, the most likely points of entry into to new re regions. So we hope that this modeling effort can, can inform us to have a much more efficient um, surveillance and, and monitoring system in place. We also hope that it will provide information around optimal control strategies. So we'll be asking questions of how much resistant material do you need in, in certain areas to really have a significant effect on, on controlling ep epidemics. So we'll be able to look through the modelling work at, at questions like that. I'd already mentioned that there's, there's going to be an extant, expanded focus on, on, on the other rusts. Very much we, we now have, have platforms, systems in, in place, and it should be relatively easy for us now to, to increase our activities around, around the other rust diseases. We're also going to see uh, more integrated tools and data sets. I mentioned that we're, we're already working on, on the other databases to incorporate in molecular data. So the, the diagnostic work that um, Les Sarbo's group has, has been developing, so all that information into the system. The trap nursery information, the Barbary work, which is, is also increasing many parts of the world, so we want to incorporate that as well. And then also the the screening nursery information. So the idea is that we'll have much, much more, uh, more diverse sets of information consolidated all into the system. Um, Fazl at um, FAO, they've they've already implemented some some nice work um, looking at, at case studies of using SMS networks. The idea here of of having that. The, the often very large um, networks of extension workers or, or even down to, to farmers eventually, they're out in the fields on a, a daily basis. They're the ones who often first see disease occurring. So it's can we capture that information um, and, and integrate it together and, and use it in a, in a useful way to, to again guide uh, con control activities. So that's, that's something we'd like to, to work together and expand those, those activities in the, in the future. So to, to wrap up, what I think with all the efforts that have, have been made from a, a, a large number of people, I mean, we've really, I think, transitioned now towards a, a fully operational global disease monitoring system. I mean, I've, I've given similar talks, but this is probably the first time that I've, I've said, said that. And I really think that we've, we've got over those, those initial steps and we, we, we now have something in place that is, is, is really coming together and is, is really operational. The surveillance monitoring network, I mean, in, in, in total, with all the, the surveys and the contribution of pathotype data, it's covering 35 countries around the world. So I think that we, we can say is, is truly, truly global. And within that, it's, it's a very large proportion of the, the developing world wheat area. I think we've been successful in being able to track the spread and the status of important stem rust races. So the, the UG99 race, race group, I think we've, we've been successful there. I think we've also been successful in putting in place a robust functional data management system. The toolbox, it's, it's now there, it's now functional, it's, it's now being, being used. And also the, the global collaborations around key, key databases, this working together, sharing integration, and then making the information available in, in different platforms. Again, I see, I see that as, as another really, really 
great adv advance that we're we're moving forward in the in the right direction. So just to finish up, I mean to thank, I mean primarily, I mean the the contributing partners from from the the different countries. I mean with, without them, none of this would have been possible. We can work on information systems, tools, but it, it just doesn't work if we don't have the, the collaborating partners c coming in. Also fantastic support and help from a range of different institutions around, around the world. I list, list them here. I mean, all of them have made, made big contributions in, into all this work. And also not forgetting, I mean, the, the donors who have, have trusted us to, to run with this work to, to make it possible. So I particularly acknowledge um, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, um, DFID from the, the UK, but also USAID, IFAD, they've, they've also contributed to the work that's been going on. Thank you very much.